Hey guys, welcome back for episode two of SNS. So what I would like to do in this episode is share with you some of the tools and some of the picks that I found whenever Abby and I took our road trip up to Ohio and back. One of the things that her and I love to do whenever we're on the road and we have the opportunity and we have the time, we love to go to antique stores, we love to go to antique malls, and any kind of old place like that that sells uh, antiques and old tools. And we all have our our little collections out there of different things, you know, and I think a lot of the guys that watch watch these videos, we're, we're all kind of in the same boat there. We have things that we enjoy, and most of you probably know the things that I like. I like old machines, I like old tools, I like vices, I like oil cans, you know. I've been lately here, I've been getting into uh, old wrenches, and so when we're out looking in these antique stores, you know, I keep my eyes out for certain things, and every now and then I spot something that's a little bit different than the normal stash of wrenches that you see there sitting on the shelf for sale. And when I see something truly unique that, that I think is unique anyway, if it's uh, what I think is a fair price that's not overpriced, I like to get it for my own personal collection. And I think we all have our little collections of things that we enjoy. And, and you know why that is, I don't know. We just all enjoy collecting something. Uh, what, it's all something different. I, I like vices. I, I love old tools. So it's just uh, it's just what we love to do. And uh, so that's what I wanted to share with you, some of these picks that I got uh, along the way whenever we were on our road trip. I've also got a, uh, a nice tool here that a, a viewer had offered up uh, to sell me. We made a deal on, so I, I purchased a nice tool I think you'll like. And then I've got a nice viewer gift that came in all the way from Germany that I think you'll like too as well. So I've also got a little bit of tool restoration on one of the picks that I got when I was in Tennessee. So I'll throw that in there as well. So let's go ahead and jump to it. So check this guy out right here. This is the tool that I made a deal with one of my viewers, Robert Wheeler. He's from Keene, New Hampshire. And this is something that he picked up that he had and thought that I might want it. And I certainly did. And this is an Armstrong number 43. This is a planer and shaper tool, and you can see right here, there is the number 43, okay? And you guys that watch my shaper videos might recognize this tool, because that is the tool that I use in my shaper. So size comparison, here's the one that I use in my shaper right here. Now, that's a number 42, and you can see the size difference between the two right there. Let me get it to where you can kind of see it there. You can see how much bigger the number 43 is compared to the number 42. It's a lot beefier. The, uh, the shank on this one is uh, 1 and 3 eighths. It actually measures right around 1.4 inches wide and 2 inches high. And I haven't me measured this one. I just grabbed it off the shaper just to show you for comparison. But this one holds a, um, a half inch wide tool bit. And then the number 43 holds a 5 8 wide tool bit. But this is exactly how Robert had, had got it. And he found this, I believe he said it was at a yard sale that he found this. And he, uh, he said that he did not pay very much money for it. And just wanted me to have it. He knew that I might like to have it. And I uh, wanted to send it my way. But uh, I offered to buy it, and that's what I did. So uh, I sent him some money for it. And uh, he was glad to send it my way. So, Robert, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. These tools are very hard to find these days. I believe that a lot of these types of tools, because they're so obsolete these days, that a lot of these probably got scrapped. Um, these were widely used on machines like planers, although you can use them on shapers. But uh, when you get into the bigger sizes like this guy right here, it's harder for these to fit into the more common lantern-sized tool post. So like this would not fit my lantern tool post that's in my shaper. This is just too wide. But there's a lot of shapers that, I'm sorry, planers that this would probably fit on no problem. And uh, this is not the biggest one. There's actually two sizes larger than this that they made. It's a lot bigger that goes up to a uh, 7 8 tool bit. I mean, you're talking about some monster tool holders. But these are multi-position, so you can turn your tool bit in different positions. You know, you can get up underneath. You can turn this tool bit to where it's pointing up so that you can get up underneath something. 
there's a lot of ways that you can use these tool bits. And anytime I get a chance to acquire one of these, I always get it because this is the kind of stuff that I like to save anyway. So, Robert, again, thank you very much for the good deal on this. I really appreciate it. And I do plan on uh, restoring this and making it look just as nice as this number 42 that I've already got here. Check out this guy right here. This was one of my, one of my finds when I was up in Ohio. It looks like a leg vise, although it doesn't have a leg that comes all the way down, but it's a small, it's a small leg vise that obviously clamps to a workbench there. I think it's very interesting, very cool. I don't know if it originally maybe had a spring in there in the middle, you know, to keep that jaw from coming out. Maybe that was something that was in there originally. But it's an excellent shape, and it's just beautiful. It's a cute little tool. It's got the little tiny anvil on the back there. So I would assume that maybe this is some type of uh, jeweler's vise. Very cool piece. I was very happy to find, find this right there. This was another very cool vise that I found whenever I was in Ohio and I had to pick it up because it looks like it, it looks like another version of a leg vise. You know, it was tagged as a uh, as a hand vise. And it's obviously a you know something that you would use, you know, in your hand. But it just it looks like something that a blacksmith made. It, it looks all handmade. Very interesting piece. It does have the spring there so that whenever you unscrew it, it pushes the jaw out. Very nice piece. Really like this. Fun score right there. This is a super cool wrench that I found when I was up in Ohio picking. And it is the Cochran Speednut wrench. Patented May 2nd, 1916, made up in Chicago. And you see how it moves here? Got the handle. As you turn the handle, it actually moves the jaw there. So designed to fit around square headed bolts or nuts. And as you, as you pull the handle to uh, adjust it up to the size of the head of the nut of the, of the bolt, it actually tightens up on it as you, get your, as, you, as you get your torque on it. Pretty neat. Saw it and I had to have it. I've never seen one before until now. Here's a little example of uh, how this one operates. I don't think it's near as convenient as a modern day adjustable wrench, you know, because it's always moving on you, but it's a very cool wrench. Here's another one of my cool wrench scores when I was on the road. This one, I don't know who the manufacturer is. It just says patent it on there. It does have a number. It's got a number there. And then we got another number there on the jaw. Uh, I'm sure my buddy up there at Hand Tool Rescue could probably look in his book and uh, tell me what this is, what the, what the make is. But what was really neat about this guy right here is the quick adjust on it. All right, so the, see how the jaw adjusts? You got this little tab right there that you push in and that allows you to uh, adjust the jaw to the size. If you look on the back side there, you can see it's got the little grooves, 
the little serrations. Very similar to some of the uh, vices that you that you see. I believe Keller is one of them that's got a handle that you pull on the side. That's how it tightens up, is uh, those grooves like that. All right, we got our little test subject there again that we're uh, gonna use to try it out. I really like this style of wrench here because the jaw just stays right there. It stays put wherever you lock it. There's no play at all. It doesn't give. Uh, even nicer than today's adjustable that's got the little screw there. It, is, it just doesn't move around. Push the little tab. The only thing that's uh, kind of ugly about it is obviously if you if you're bringing it up there for a smaller size bolt, you've got the you know this piece part of the jaw that sticks up above it. But other than that, that is a super cool wrench right there. Love it. Very neat. This is one of my prized wrenches that I found when I was up in Ohio doing some antiquing. And this is an adjustable alligator wrench. This is what I consider an adjustable alligator wrench anyway. So it is made by the McKibben Universal Wrench Company in Nashville, Tennessee. McKibben Catch Quick, 18 inch, patent pending. It's very cool. You got an adjuster right here in the center of the jaws that you adjust with your hand to open and close the two jaws right there. And uh, one of the jaws pivots on this piece right here. Very neat wrench, and this one's in excellent condition. It doesn't look like it's ever been abused or mistreated. And I found it just like this in this condition. It's an excellent piece, and I think it's very cool. Very neat wrench. Really like that one there. So I found my very first official King Dick Fish Billy wrench. And I got this one up in Ohio. And you can see right there on the top, the King Dick trademark. It still works good. It's in real good shape. Whoever had it cleaned it up, give it a little polish. So this is the one that is uh, my buddy Hand Tool Rescue. See, this is the one that he makes and the one that he gave me. And this is the, uh, the wrench that he modeled his after. You can see the resemblance right there. Very similar. Um, they call them pocket wrenches or a bicycle wrench or a fish belly wrench. I, I just kind of consider them a fish belly wrench. But very neat. This is the one that he got his uh, design after right there. The first one that I found out in the wild. This is another uh, fish belly wrench or a pocket wrench that I found. And what I thought was really unique about this, this is another one that's, in, uh, that, that's been inspired by uh, Hand Tool Rescue. And uh, this one is uh, Henry and Allen Incorporated, Auburn, New York, and size F right there. Still works great. You see how small it is. All right. So Eric over at Hand Tool Rescue, this is his mini. And you can see in size comparison right there, Whenever I found this, I thought it was very close in size to his uh, mini wrench right there. And uh, I had to pick it up, man. I just thought that was so cool. And you can see it's very similar in shape and size. Just Eric's is a little bit smaller. But very first one that I ever found of this size right there. So I had to have it. I love picking up these, uh, these wrenches like this. They've inspired me to find them. This is my full collection of pocket wrenches or fish belly wrenches there. This is another one that I had picked up along the way that I scored. This one's in not so good condition. You can see the jaw is actually bent right there, but I didn't pay very much. Just paid a few bucks for this one right there. I had to pick it up. I'd like to get it cleaned up. Just a nice one to add to the collection. We've got our two for our hand tool rescue. We got the new, the new one right there that we just picked up, the Henry and Allen. And then we got the King Dick. And then these are two of the billings that I've already had. These I've already cleaned up and uh, re-blued them. This one here and uh, this one right here. I've had this one for a little while there as well. You can see the billings. 
these are the ones that I hunt for whenever I'm out looking at the wrenches or some of the other oddities. But thought I would share my little collection of uh, pocket wrenches there with you. Nice little collection I got going on. I want you to check out this super cool French made coach wrench that I found in Alabama when I was out traveling. And I want to thank my buddy Eric over at Hand Tool Rescue for helping me identify this wrench. I could not tell what it was, but Eric, give me a hand. And so this particular wrench is uh, Pezzo Frere, meaning Pezzo Brothers. And he says that this company was started in 1810. And this particular double-headed wrench was considered a coach wrench that would have been used on coaches or wagons, you know, that sort of thing. And it is a double headed wrench there. One may be able to consider this uh, one side for Imperial, maybe the other side for metric. <laughs> Who knows? But it is a very, very cool wrench, very old, and it's in beautiful condition. Absolutely love it. You can see the, the maker's marks up there at the top. They're pretty hard to make out right up there. And you can kind of make out where it, there it says French. And then on the back of it there, Eric had asked me if there's a lion on it. And you can just kind of make out part of the lion standing on an arrow. That's part of the logo there. They do have the, uh, the grooves and serrations cut into the jaws there on both sides. Okay. There's a um, couple things that I wanted to point out and show you. So we have a, a hexagonal handle. This is a wood handle, and then the rest of it is steel. So one of the features that I wanted to point out was the, the, uh, the threaded feature here for use for adjusting. Now, looking at the thread, so this is, you have a right hand and a left hand thread. Now, when you look at this left hand thread, Looking at it, it looks like it has a much higher helix angle to it, right, than the, than the right-hand threads. Well, this is actually a double start thread. If you follow that around, there's one right there. And as we come around, there's the start of the second thread. So you have a double start left-handed thread, and that is why it moves so, so rapidly. When, that's what causes the quick adjust there when you spin the handle. So you can see the right-hand side here is moving much slower than the left hand side and that's what you uh, would use for a quick adjust on these jaws right there just a very neat feature i wanted to show that to you and point that out so besides all the cool old wrenches that i've already shown you this was the rest of the stuff that i got up in ohio uh, I, well i would say you know between alabama kentucky and ohio because that was in tennessee that was the states that we visited on our road trip there and just a collection of uh, different size alligator wrenches i like picking these things up whenever i find them for a, a reasonable price i have found these that people were asking uh, way too much money for them and i just pass them up but i can get these for a good price i'll i'll pick them up this one's neat because it says santa fe on it right there and I'm um, starting to build up a nice size range of these alligator wrenches. I'm still looking for some of the bigger ones and I'm just keeping my eye out for them. This was a nice little find too right here. This is a Greenfield Tap and Die uh, Double Lot Tap Wrench. This is the smallest one that they made and it's like in brand new condition. Still got the color case hardening on there. It's been well preserved, well taken care of, still works just like new. Just love those, those little tap wrenches when they've been uh, taken care of like that got a couple of uh, parallels right here always like picking those up whenever I find these and uh, these are very useful in the milling machine vices just different different alligator wrenches you know there was a couple of neat picking spots that I found where you know these things were just a couple bucks a piece so I was digging through the stash just uh, picking some up and just uh, made like a nice little cash deal on, you know, a handful of these things like this. All right. <clears throat> Thought this was a neat wrench right here. This is one that would go to an actual lathe. Uh, maybe something like a carriage, you know, use it for the carriage lock or anything on a, on a lathe. So I got that. We're going to do some rust treatment on that. 
uh, all these alligator wrenches right here. Oh, I found this, you know, I like the Craftsman Handy Cuts, and I happened to find this one right here. They were asking five bucks for it, so I picked it up. It's one of the Made in USA versions. Uh, oddly enough, it is missing the screw that goes right there that holds the anvil on. Uh, it's not hindering the use of it, but I could definitely fix that. So I thought it'd be cool to pick that up. Got this oddball looking, uh, you know, machinist jack right there I found. And uh, this, this crescent wrench I got, it was not very much, Crescent Tool Company. And look how big, the, uh, how, how thick the head on that thing is, man. Just nice and heavy duty, like having these things around. Like I, I bought one of these at an estate sale, that's an 18 inch version, and I keep it in my truck. And I'll, all I use it for is changing the balls out whenever I need to, you know, trailer ball. So these are handy to have in different areas around the shop. So, and the last thing right here was this nice Greenfield tap and die drill index. These are pretty cool. This is for numbered drills. This is the Greenfield tap and die logo in the shape of a thread. And it was funny because Abby usually spots this kind of stuff now. And she saw this sitting on the uh, shelf right behind me. We were in the we were in a booth in an uh, antique store. And she says, oh, look, there's a drill index. I turn around and <laughs> there it was. So I always pick these up because I love collecting these too. So. There's my uh, wrench collection from the Ohio trip. Almost forgot about these guys sitting over there. This is two letter sets that I picked up, and I remember I got these uh, in Chattanooga. And uh, I got these because I, had, uh, I don't have any number or letter stamps this size. So these are 3H character size, and the, uh, the letter set there is made by Matthews of Pittsburgh, is what it says there on the stamp. So those are nice, big letter stamps right there and then there's this number set there as well i think this is a different brand that says standard benchmade three eighths in size unfortunately the uh it did not come with the uh, wooden caps that go over this but this is just how they were being sold just like so so i'm going to go ahead and uh get started cleaning some of these up i'm going to do some rust removal on these and uh, get these things cleaned up looking better still got my tub of uh, rust remover soak here that we're going to use I'm going to go ahead and drop these uh, smaller alligator wrenches down in there and also this uh, Billings fish belly wrench and that wrench there. I will just do this right here. A little quicker.
So I'm just about finished with the uh, little light restoration on the letter stamps here. And I've already got them blued. And I thought I would uh, go ahead and point out a couple things. So uh, first thing, of course, we've already got them blued. And I'm using this, uh, this is some CRC SP350. This is some corrosion inhibitor that I wanted to try on uh, doing tool restorations and, of course, any tools around the shop. And I wanted to use this for, like, uh, tool dunking whenever I do uh, rust removal, if we're using a vapor rust or something like that. Uh, this is some right here. I poured a little bit into this container and just simply took the, uh, the, the letter stamps and just dunked it in there. So this particular formula here, the SP300, does not dry. They also have another one, the SP250, that does dry. I wanted to use the one that stays oily. So these will maintain that oily feel to them and it'll inhibit uh, rust for a very long time. Now this, I will point out this is for indoor use. This is not for outdoor use. So I'm looking forward to using this for, for my uh, tool restorations that are gonna be inside here. All right, so about the uh, the letter stamps here, I figured out that there's a couple, there was one missing and it was the letter I. And uh, going back to that clip where I showed you, you know, these unrestored, there was a, in one of the holes, there was a uh, piece of square stock in one of those. I didn't realize that, that, that that one was not an actual stamp. It was just a piece of square stock that somebody stuck in there. And uh, so the letter I was missing. The other thing too is that this one here, the, the uh, letter B, is actually damaged. Somebody punched something that was hard and it flattened it out, okay? So that one really is no good. I had uh, put out a feeler there on Instagram and Facebook just to let everybody know about that and uh, to see if anybody might have this particular letter set floating around in their shop. Some un, you know, incomplete sets you never know when you're when you, you guys are out there picking you might come across something like this right here for for dirt cheap but anyway that's a long shot there so of course i looked on ebay there was a couple sets on there and there was an incomplete set of this size on ebay for a um, make an offer price so i made a very low offer on that set and lo and behold they accepted it so I did buy another set of these that's incomplete, but it's going to give me the two characters that I need, the B and the I. So I'll have a fully complete set now that'll be fully restored once I get that one in. That one in. So I was going to um, just kind of show you that. I'm going to finish putting this in the, the wood block there. I cleaned that up and just uh, wiped it off with some of the uh, Kramer's uh, restoration oil that I bought. All right. And then this, uh, here's the other set right there. This is the, the number set, and I'll show you. So you can take this. All right, all I'm going to do is just do just like that. I'm going to put it right back in the block, and I'm just going to leave them. And that will stay oily, and it will inhibit rust for a long time. I'm not worried about it getting on that wood either. So this should be some good stuff for these uh, hand tools that I like to clean up. And my shop is climate controlled anyway, so I don't have any problems with rust like I used to, but there are months whenever the, the weather is really nice, you know, in the fall and the spring, when the weather is nice, I open the doors. So there may be times when it's not very hot that the doors are open, and the shop is subject to some moisture to get in here. So at those times, I might notice some kind of, you know, moisture getting on uh, bare metal tools or surfaces in the shop. But this is the stuff that I'm gonna start using right there for my uh, tool restoration. It's just like these guys. These are some machinist squares that I picked up from uh, Jeff, Jeff Klo. Got those for a really good buy from him, but I what I plan on doing with these, I want to clean them up. You can see they got they got surface rust on them, but they clean up really well. Keith Rucker bought the same ones. He bought the other batch of them, and he already cleaned his up with evapor rust and uh, sold them. So I kind of plan on doing the same thing with those. I just I haven't had time to get to them, but that's what I do want to do with these uh, these squares. They're all high quality uh both sterret and brown and sharp 
machine of squares and in different sizes this is one that didn't have didn't have the uh, the wooden case you can see brown and sharp right there and then this um, this SP 300 will work good for that put that in a spray can and spray it down all right all we got left is uh, waiting for my other set to come in and I can complete this one with the uh, the B and the I but the restored and oiled down I'll put them in the drawer here you see some of my other sets that I got in there all right one of the things I was going to point out was uh, I went ahead and picked up this bucket here and this is a, a removable lid called a gamma lid but you can snap that down and then you can unscrew that okay so that you can take the top off so what I plan on doing is uh, I'm going to put the uh, SP300 in that bucket and I'm going to label that bucket what it is so that I have a, an actual bucket here when I do tool restorations when I pull things out of the evapor rust, I can actually uh, dip them in this fluid right there, that rust inhibitor. So this vise right here, this is the gift that came all the way from Germany. And this was uh, given to me by a viewer of mine named Gunnar Brand. And we've been uh, talking quite a while about, about this particular vise. And Gunnar knows that I've been a... I've been, you know, collecting vices for a little while now, and he knows that I, I haven't shown any of these. I haven't got any, any of these particular vices in my collection, and apparently that this particular brand is uh, very common over in Germany. That's where, that's where these were made is over in Germany. So he wanted to uh, acquire one and send it my way for my collection, uh, with the hopes that maybe I'll do a restoration on this one of these days. So. Uh, I don't know if this is how you actually pronounce this, but H-E-U-E-R, I think, I, I'll usually say it, uh, Hewer, but I don't know if that's correct, but Hewer, and the model for this one is the front, so Hewer front, and it is a six inch vise right there, and this one is in really good shape, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this vise whatsoever, it's just, uh, it's been well taken care of, and it's also a well used vise, you know, so it's got your, uh, common marks on it you can see a little bit of grinding marks up there where people's been up here grinding something but they're actually the tops of the jaws are pretty smooth you can still see the uh the serrations in there but a uh, unique way that they that they made these they made them very strong and light see they're not very bulky like you know we're used to seeing our big reed vices uh, these are drop forged drop forged vices you got your screw that goes through this right here, all right, and then you got your moving jaw, this barrel here that goes through there, kind of, kind of like a uh, a Wilton in a way, okay. But your screw is up there, so it, you know, the two pieces are parallel to each other. But Gunner was uh, nice enough to let me wipe my hands off here so I don't get it all dirty, but. He was nice enough to send a bunch of literature along with this vice right there for uh, for me to read and uh, learn more about this particular vice there. It's pretty neat seeing, you know, the uh, the catalog picture of what it actually looked like. So he wrote some notes on here on uh, how it's actually supposed to come apart in case I want to do a restoration and take the thing apart and get it all cleaned up, do any work that might need to be done to it. He's got a nice note in there that he wrote. You can see right here it shows the two different models there's the primus and then there's the front you go in further into this literature information that he printed out what's really cool is that we see some manufacturing pictures in the catalog here of how they actually did their machining this this looks like this goes way back to you know um i don't know somewhere around the 30s 40s world war ii era something like that i i'm not sure maybe before that i'm not really sure uh, he did point out that this company is uh it's still in business but they don't make this model anymore i do believe they offer repairs on this vice though what he said in his note there's some breakdown of the uh the primus model raw parts but 
this is neat. So he's sending me these printouts of the machine shop. I know it's hard to see, but this is really neat. You can you can see all the machines that uh, went into the operation. I see a lot of horizontal mills in these uh, in these pictures. Now look at that. You can see the line powered shop up here. The the line the line shaft should I say that's driving a lot of the equipment in here. There's some neat pictures. Look at the look at the line shaft up here running all the machines. These are some shapers right here. These two guys are running shapers. It looks like it might be three of them actually. Very cool. There's a guy actually working. So there's a there's a worker using his vice. There's a guy doing some welding. And in here he's talking about how expensive these can be over here in the US. This is was an eBay one going for $360, just like this. <laughs> so, Gunner, I really appreciate it. This is a sweet tool. Going to enjoy having this. So I'm going to put it with the collection. And one of these days, we will get this thing cleaned up, give it a proper restoration, and uh, maybe we'll get it mounted on one of our benches here and actually put this thing to work. Very nice tool. Thank you very much. I almost forgot to mention that he sent in some uh, plastic soft jaws. These are the magnetic soft jaws that you can put in here and use. You got the, uh, the little V notches in there for holding rounds. So he sent those and he also sent the aluminum version there as well. So I wanted to point that out. I almost forgot about that. So thank you, Gunner. Really appreciate that. How cool is that? <laughs>